to record. Okay, there we go. Chris, it's All here. right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks for being here. So this particular uh, webinar is called Necessary Components of Successful AAC Consideration and Implementation. I don't actually know how far we'll get into the implementation piece. Uh, sometimes I've done this webinar in actually two sets because the whole consideration piece needs to be one component and the implementation piece is really another component. There's selection and implementation. You can get all the slides right here at bit.ly slash PEXATAAC. That's the entire slide deck and there are lots of slides. Like I said, we will not get through it. It's, it's not about, hey, can we get through every slide? It's just a resource meant for you. Um, and that QR code is another way. Since we have two people here, uh, a little and, and just tell me which your interest is in it. Was it first? Oh, hi there. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I think I was more so interested in just hearing about the consideration process and how you'd go about in doing a specific assessment and then what tools that then leads it to, I mean, in terms of trials and things. Um, I'd like to become more skilled here in our district to be able to do the AAC evaluation myself mm -hmm. and kind of what your framework is and what tools you use to um, kind of determine a, a successful, I guess, evaluation to then lead to the implementation and trials. Awesome questions, you know, and um, I will talk through that instead of like showing you slides, if you will, uh, okay. because I think I'm going to blow your mind a little bit about how we do that and how okay. moving Cheryl, forward. Uh, them, Cheryl, what about you? Oh, I don't know if you can hear me because our buses are being called right now. <laughs> of course they are. <laughs> <laughs> For the next 10 minutes. Um, but I do, I, I specialize in AAC and I think it's just always great to get somebody else's perspective. And sometimes you figure out what you're doing right and sometimes you figure out what you're doing wrong. Sure, sure. Well, and there's no guarantee here what I'm about to tell you is, is um, you know, right or wrong, you know. Uh, there's different shades of gray here. But um, do you have the same question with... But, uh, you know, the, the selection process and the assessment process and how you choose what you choose and then how you verify what you chose is the right thing that you chose. Is that all part of your, uh, your thought process as well or questions you have? Um, well, it's what we do. So I certainly have a process and I have an AAC specialist. Technically, I'm a generalist um, coming from Merrimack and uh, I have somebody who comes in and consults, but overall with her training, I've been able to decide on languages and trials and I've changed. I've only been in Merrimack two years. I have changed seven languages in two years. Because seven languages, meaning like the, the device that they're using? Like mm -hmm, the device. A lamp or a lamp, plant lamp or yeah. something yeah, like that? Yeah, because as they grew, they didn't move forward. They stayed on the same thing. And mm -hmm. it wasn't, it didn't work for them five years ago. <laughs> it still wasn't working great for them. So we tried different languages and they all had much more success. Can I just say, Cheryl, I've never heard someone say it the way you just said it, even though we use that as an analogy all the time for how to uh, talk about uh, teaching AAC is that it's often um, teaching language and that we use the word language and it's like learning a foreign language. But the way you said it, it just came so smoothly, like, yeah, I've, I've changed languages. I use, I changed, like, it sounds like you use that terminology frequently. Uh, I do, I do. And really they are, if you look at the way they're set up, touch chat is very different from Coloco, very different from LAMP. So it's sure. like English, Spanish, and German. Yes, yeah, that's exactly the analogies we use. Okay, that's fantastic. Uh, uh, so you, it sounds like you have some familiarity with those different uh, apps. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And Elizabeth, would you say that too? Um, oh, yes, for sure. We're uh, more, I'm more familiar with touch chat, but I do have some experience with Words for Life um, through LAMP and then um, other programming as well. So I do have experience in that and have done the assistive technology program through UNH. So I do have a certain, you know, understanding of all of this. I guess I was wondering more of a pro the process in which you use to kind of, um, you know, for consideration for AAC. Sure. You know what? Um, 
Mike, can I ask you a question real quick? You can ask me anything you want. I was just staying out of the way. It was a great conversation. Yeah, no, it is. It is. Um, so the slide deck that I have right now, um, and this is why I need your feedback, is not really pertaining to what Elizabeth was just mentioning, but I have another slide deck that does. And I'm wondering if I, because it's more about the process and the selection, because um, I'm, I'm debating whether I should flip over to do that or not, but I also know that you're recording and that we're anticipating uh, more people than just Elizabeth and Cheryl watching this, this webinar. So what are your thoughts? So, so my thought is because uh, these guys are here and that's what you guys want to talk about. I vote for flipping over and, nope. and we can always, you know, we, we maybe look at taking parts of this slide deck that you were going to show right now. Mm -hmm. And finding a way to roll that into next week when we're in person, maybe as like a little small group conversation. Sure. I, how does it, Elizabeth, Cheryl? Yeah, yeah. That, works. that works for me. I don't want to also be um, kind of derailing you as your plan today, because no. I know we can talk about all of these things also maybe on Friday as well, next Friday. So, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to flip over and I'm going to show you something different. Okay. It's just going to take me a yeah. second. Um, before, I, sounds good. Uh, before I do that, Elizabeth and Cheryl, I want to show you the kind of what I call this, my six principles for, con for consideration. Like these are the six things that are always in my mind when I'm trying to uh, help teams consider AAC. And so I'm, go I'm going to stay with this slide deck just for a minute to go through those six and then we'll flip over and we'll talk more specifically what that consideration pro process looks like if, you if you're cool with that. So um, I'm going to jump out of full screen mode here so that I can jump around a little bit. And I'm going to jump to this mode. And see how I have this big number six over here in the left-hand corner? Right? There are six, and I call them necessary components, right? Six things that you need to know when you're considering AAC. And one of them I find, and, and, and please jump in anytime, Elizabeth and, and Cheryl and Mike too, if you find this with uh, the people that you work with, that the number one component, something that I, when I've done trainings in the past, I, I wouldn't past like five years ago, I wouldn't have thought of, but we have to work on this concept of presuming potential. There's so many people that work with AAC that they have, they put, they put kind of artificial limits on kids and they don't, they think, ah, they'll never be able to say thousands of words. They'll never get there. So I'm only going to give them this thing that's only got, you know, eight to 10 words on it. Um, do you find that? Do you find that uh, this, the mindset of the people that are meant to help the people with dis disabilities that have language are, are one of the, the first things you have to change? Uh, yeah, I guess I just had a conversation with somebody and they were talking about, well, maybe they're not accessing the device because they don't know the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. like, well, we access the vocabulary and then we learn what it means. Exactly. Right? So exactly. we have to set up the environment so they can figure out what it means. And again, they, they want to teach them in a sterile environment that a book is a book instead of let's get the book and read the book. And you like the book? I want the book. Yes. Yes. Well, that leads into the, uh, the next component, but, um, which is of course core vocabulary, right? Yes. Is part of what you're getting at. Uh, you guys have heard the word snug, right? Yep. Elizabeth and Cheryl, you're both thumbs up on snug. I'm actually no. not. I'm not. I, I'm not. Okay. Well, great. Then let's talk about that. So if the first component, the necessary component is believe that the students will be able to say whatever they want to say, however they want to say that, uh, that someday if we gave them the right tools and the right instruction and given enough time, they'll be able to say whatever they want to say, that we have to believe that they will, right? Uh, so that's component number one. Um, what? They'll believe they'll do what? Well, what they'll believe they'll do is that by the leave us, when they leave their time with us, what do we want them to be able to do? And that's an acronym called SNUG, which is Spontaneous Novel Utterance Generation. They'll be able to spontaneously say whatever they want to say, just like you and I do, just like anyone else does. Meaning um, at any moment, I can take any sorts of words that are out there and I can string them to get it together to say uh, just anything, you know, like I could say right now, um, a purple minotaur came running through the woods and threw his axe through my window and I caught it and I used it as a spoon to eat my soup. You know, these words came off the top of my head 
I, you could picture the story that was happening. It syntactically, the order of the words made sense. I have that ability to generate whatever I want to say, uh, as fantastical as it might be, and so do you, and and, and so does so does it, everybody else. So so why wouldn't we think that kids who need AAC would also be able to do that? Again, given enough time and the right tools, and, and uh, the right instruction. Um, and so that's what I try and shoot people for. Is that cool? Does that make sense? It does. And um, as a clinician who works with kids who are older generally, who've been on the AAC for many years, though sometimes I get a ninth grader that hasn't been tested, um, I find that the people teach a very specific uh, sentence structure that doesn't allow the child to move forward. Right? They have no verbs because they've been ing it for years. <laughs> Absolutely. And they, they're not doing the spontaneous thing there. They, they right. might be generating utterances, but it's not spontaneous. It's not necessarily their own utterances, right? Yeah. And it's, it's certainly not approach. novel. It's certainly yeah. not novel, something no one's ever heard of before, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, rote. Um, okay, so that's the end goal, is to try and get kids as close to snug as possible. We have to believe that we can get there, right? But then the next component is what we had touched upon, it would be the core vocabulary. Or, so next component would be expecting work for snug, right? But then core vocabulary. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip past this because unless Elizabeth, Cheryl, you're both like, no, Chris, what is core vocabulary? I'm going to guess if you guys know those systems that you're like, yep, Chris, got it, good. Is that yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> Elizabeth, same thing? I just have a question with you uh, for you about core vocabulary because I definitely understand what that is within the systems. Some okay. other um, AAC specialists that have come out really talk about working just with the core as much as possible because um, I just wanted to hear your kind of interpretation of this because the core has kind of been developed for that reason and trying to use that as much as possible um, and then slowly building in um, more language specific type things that may be based on interests or, you know, classes they have, et cetera. What is your thought on that? Yeah, so I'm gonna jump to this slide right here. And I'm gonna, have you heard of the 80-20 rule? Because this is my spin on yes. So the 80-20 rule is, um, you know, it's rule is more of a guideline, but uh, where the, the concept of core vocabulary came from is, is, is that it's 80% of what we say, 75 to 80% of what we say is made up of the same set of 300 to 400 words, right? Somewhere in there. Uh, studies vary on that, but it's mostly the same set of words. And that makes up, like I said, 80 percent of what we say. And the 20 percent of what we say is the more fringe vocabulary, you know, which are really the nouns, right? Mostly nouns. And so you, once upon a time when people really started to get into core vocabulary and understand that if we taught core vocabulary, that we could get kids 80 percent of the way, you, you, myself included, we sort of jumped in overboard if you will, and said, everything has to be core all the time. You like, we do core vocabulary. Let's teach the words this and that rather than spoon and fork, you know, um, which I still do pr pri primarily. Um, but I've backed off, and I think many of us have backed off to, to, to go, well, wait a second. If, if typical development and typical speech is at an 80-20 ratio, then why are we trying to teach core vocabulary 100% of the time? Maybe the, the better instructional model would be 80 20. Uh, and this might also allow us to have a little handshake with the people who are not so core focused, meaning they, uh, they, 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 they are not sold on it or it doesn't fit with their instructional paradigm. You know, they, they are much more noun based. I think you know who I'm talking about, right? Uh, <laughs> people will, will want to teach cookie and say point to cookie, touch the cookie without, like you were saying, um, you know, or book, you know, without saying, talking about we read the book and we, I like the book and I like the character, right? And so this allows for a little bit of wiggle room, you know, that 80% of the time we're going to work on core vocabulary and 20% of the time we're going to work on fringe vocabulary. Does that help, Elizabeth, Cheryl? Oh, definitely. And I'm working with the other end of the population of preschoolers, primarily mm -hmm. three to five-year-olds. So um, yes, that definitely does. Yeah, and then it becomes a little bit of a game when you're planning to think about, okay, when I'm developing my lesson plan or when I'm developing my lesson plan, the, the educational experiences that I'm designing for my week, right? How do I 
factor in the time so that, that 80 percent of it is is teaching vocabulary that is core vocabulary and 20 percent of the time is fringe and i've seen that done different ways some teachers will do it like okay monday is modeling monday so i'm going to be modeling my new vocabulary words on monday tuesday is going to be um uh, all about uh, literacy instruction and i'm going to do predictive chart writing and things like that uh, and if you don't know what that is, there's slides on them later. That's, that's, that's the implementation side. But, um, and, and maybe we get to Friday, and Friday's Fringe Friday, right? Where I focus more of my Friday around the fringe vocabulary that go around the core vocabulary. Um, that's how some people do it. Uh, but other people try and build the fringe vocabulary in uh, all day long. You know, like I'm going to model words on the device, uh, you know, in this half hour chunk of time, I'm going to focus on my core vocabulary uh, for the first 25 minutes and use some fringe vocabulary for the last five or work on fringe vocabulary for the first five minutes and then start to show them some more. So there's different ways you could, you could do it, but the idea is that you're planning for it. Make sense? Yeah. And sound good? Does that clarify it at all to answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank cool. you. Cool. And there's other slides in here because you have the whole slide deck that you can look at to see. So, so co concept number three of those six is teach core vocabulary, right? But the, focus your instruction mostly on core vocabulary, but not exclusively on core vocabulary. Component four cannot be, um, cannot be stressed enough in my mind. And that is you have to consider the motor plan. Um, the most proficient users of AAC uh, that I've ever seen are people that can use their device with ever, without looking at it. You know, I've seen a guy with autism strap it over his shoulder, put it down on his side right here, right? And now he's, and he'll be talking to me and talking to you by looking at you and then using his fingers over on the side, like playing a, like a guitar, you know, not really looking at it. He's just talking because the motor plan has been consistent. You know, I don't know if you've ever heard of Chris Klein. Have you, have you met Chris Klein or heard him speak before? Elizabeth, Cheryl, Chris Klein. I haven't, heard I haven't heard him speak though. Okay, so he is a guy. He uses um, a communication device with his big toe. Right, he has CP, and he he talks about this motor plan all the time. He uses an old what is it like a uh, Vantage maybe? I think it's a Vantage. You know, they don't even make those anymore. And he buys them off of eBay and gets them all over the place because he has backups units on top of backup units because he doesn't want to change the motor plan. He's so super fast with his toe, and he, he knows if he went to a more updated system, you have to relearn the motor plan, which he knows he can do, but gosh, it's going to suck, you know, to have to do that, you know. It'd be, the, the, the analogy I use is like swapping the S and the Q on your keyboard. You know, if I went to Mike right now, as a practical joke, on April, April 1st, I swapped the S and Q on his keyboard, he'd be like, dark, dark, every time he type. He'd be cursing me up and down because I swapped those two keys and he could relearn it, right? But why would I do that to him? And why would you do that to me? Why, why would I, I do that? <laughs> Next <laughs> April 1st, though. You know I mean? um, so this is a, a, sort of a, a thing that when we're thinking through the consideration process, uh, Elizabeth, back to your original question, is I, I keep this in the forefront. Once upon a time, I would say, keep it in the back of my mind. And now it's in the front of my mind all the time is that, am I moving the buttons around? And what does it mean when I move the buttons around? Because if I move the buttons around, it means they have to start over again with burning, building those motor plans. So we try and keep the motor plans as consistent as possible, which means keeping the, the, the pictures in the same location, we keep those as consistent as possible. Does that sound, are you thinking that way? Or do you have thoughts about that or questions? Um, no, that's exactly how I operate. So making sure buttons are in consistent spots. The vo vocabulary, you know, can grow. I mean, there's also been times in which you kind of can have more buttons on a screen, but kind of work off a, a middle or a certain corner of it. So you can slowly add vocabulary based on number of selections and things. So, yep, that's, that's yeah, spot on with my thought as well. Sure. And Cheryl, so that's super important for you said you've changed language systems. I think yeah. that all the time is like, okay, we have to be 100% confident that it's time to change the language system. And we're not doing something that we could um, change the instruction instead of changing the language system. Because once we change the language system, that means we move the buttons around, you know. 
Yes, um, I used to be very strict about where the buttons were. And then I used ProLoquo a little bit more. And mm -hmm. innately, their activity programs and their templates don't always put the words in the same place. I know and that. <laughs> I have found that uh, the kiddo that I moved to it, it isn't a problem for her. It's more of awesome. a problem for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then touch chat, you try to put it in the same place, but it is so programmed that moving one button to get that where it belongs means I just move that one out of the place it belongs in. Yes, so. exactly. Which are huge things to consider when you are selecting something in the first place, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. And then there's buttons that are in multiple places. You need the same word in multiple places, you know, and that can be tricky. Prolo quote, by the way, since you're both familiar, um, it has moved towards trying to stay more consistently with most motor plans. You know, once upon a time, they weren't thinking this at all. And as the research developed around motor plans and the user's experiences, you know, talking to actual people who use AAC have been saying, no, you need to try and keep the motor plan consistent. They reworked how they designed their, their app, right? Would you agree? Uh, it's, it, it used to be an app I wouldn't even think about using. <laughs> right. <laughs> Let me put it that way. How's that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, you know, that's, that's one of my favorites. Cheryl, that must, that you. That ages me, I guess. Yeah, I was going to say, because <laughs> um, a lot of people would say that like when you first, when Prolo Quo first came out, the people that really knew it were like, what is this? You know, yeah. this is not some great, great thing that's coming out. This is a mess, you know? Yeah, uh, just because it's on it, but they have gotten uh, way better because they read the research. Yes, I agree. Yeah, like you said. So, um, okay. So, are you with me with these components so far? Uh, all of them jiving with with you? Yes. Yes. Awesome. All right. The sixth comp or the fifth component would be modeling using least to most prompting, and what I mean by that is this sort of hierarchy here of prompting is that when I'm working with a student. Um, I, I would model, which of course is going to be the sixth component, um, but uh, then try and move through this sort of hierarchy as a, as a, as a way to start uh, with, with giving the least most prompts, which might just be waiting. And then it might be then, then moving up to the next level of prompt, which is like, here's the communication. About, um, Here's the communication device in my hand. Like I'm still silent, but I'm going to drink. I'm going to do this to you as an option, and I'm just going to gesture towards you. And you can read the rest. You get progressively more. And it sounds like Elizabeth and Cheryl, you probably do this already. What's your experiences around the prompt hierarchy? And do you, do you use it? Do you teach it? Uh, yes. I mean, right now I'm in a setting where most people are already trained in it. Okay. Um, through the BCBAs, but um, the big thing that I'm training is when do, you, when and how often do you need to drop that back to the lowest as fast as you can? <laughs> they tend to overprompt, and I definitely yes. promote aided language. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, I just did a, a video with Lauren Kay, um, our AAC specialist, to show the difference between aided language and teaching. <laughs> uh, would you you made video like is it on YouTube? Uh, no, well, we're going to upload it to our parents and our parents here, but it clearly shows when I have an expectation that you will use these buttons. These are the ones we're working on. Mm -hmm. We're reading a book. These are your vocabulary words opposed to we're chatting and I'm modeling. I'm not ever mandating that you say anything to me. Yes. Yes. That's brilliant. That is so brilliant. So yeah, that is, of course, as you, you brought up, um, uh, well, I guess the last component is, is have fun, but the, um, that whole idea of aided language stimulation is by, by modeling, I guess I will go into the same component five there, um, and that concept of descriptive teaching where I'm just going to describe what I'm doing first, you know, um, uh, it, it, we jump, I feel, too prevalently, we jump to uh, having expectations of kids touching the, the, the devices. Uh, I'm offering it as an option you know, all the time, and I'm prompting you to use it, but I'm not demanding your use until I've modeled on it, you know, lots and lots and lots of times. Yes. Cool. Yeah, a typical learner has to hear a word 50 times, right, before it becomes part of their lexicon? 
and yeah, that's I don't. Winner. Is it fifty or more? You know, um, have you heard of this? Um, so here's the analogy I like to use with that, like hearing it or ex it being having exposed mm -hmm. to it, is I mm -hmm. think of all the different words, not just the words, but the um, language concepts, like ing, ed, morphemes, if you will. Yes. Um, uh, they, each one of those in my mind, in the kid's mind, is a sand timer, like the little pictures back there. I don't know if you can see that. Um, and so each time I'm modeling, I'm putting a little grain of sand for the ING, or I'm putting a little grain of sand in the, uh, in the ED bucket or in the ED sand timer. And eventually, if I put enough grains of sand, it will spill over and the kid will start to use it. And that, this analogy seems to work well for the paras that I'm working with, the paraprofessionals, um, and some of the teachers too. Like, oh, I mean, I have to put grains of sand. I have to use it. I, I have to show them. I have to I have to show them how to use this. Like, like you said, fifty, yeah, maybe fifty, well, maybe three three hundred. Yeah, it's just a typical learner. Exactly. A typical learner needs it fifty plus times to really learn it. Let alone a kid with a language disability. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, and and back to that consideration process. It's a question that I ask all the time: um, is how do how did typical learners learn ing? Right? How did this little baby here learn ING? Well, her parents and her grandparents and her uh, siblings and everyone else in her, and the doctor when, she's, when she goes there, um, they all have ING and you're just immersed in an environment like that. So, um, so how many times have we put grains of sand in there? To, to, how many times do they have to hear it to, to start to learn ING? And ING doesn't even develop for many years for uh, uh, like, like it past the age of two in, in some cases. Mm -hmm. So, and that's typical developer. So, what does that mean when we're making the selection of the device? Because a lot of times I see this in many decks of the woods. Maybe you're not, not your neck of the woods, but I see people use static boards. Long use static board, and eventually I'll graduate someone to using a device. But how do you get to ING on a static board? You know, when do you wait? Why are you waiting? You know, what if we could use an actual device and model ING on here, and that gets you more grains of sand? You know, and the same thing with ED, and say the same thing for lots of other words. You know, yes. Uh, I see it all the time. We have a core vocabulary initiative. We have core boards all over the place, which is not a bad thing. Don't get me wrong. But is it the only thing you're using? Because how are you modeling this ING then? And how are you modeling ED? Does that make sense? Does that resonate with you? And do you, what are your thoughts? Uh, yes, I definitely have seen static boards. I see a lot of, they're teaching I see, I hear, I want. And that is not, I look at language development. How do typical kids develop and what comes first and what comes last? So yes, and it, it just has to be modeled. I've actually used framing your thoughts to structure the teaching so that, say the paras, thank you, the paras have a, a format to go with so that they can understand the pieces of language that we're looking at. This child needs all of these pieces, not just a couple of them. When you say framing your thoughts, what do you mean? Like, how do you make it visual for them to understand? Uh, framing your thoughts is a, an actual program to teach sentence structure. Oh, okay. So I, it has visuals. So really you take the language out by giving the kids the visuals so they learn those symbols so it reduces the amount of time they have to think about what they need to produce and they're learning the parts of speech and the orders that they go in and how words are associated and what I can add and not add. And um, my AAC specialist at first was like, I don't know about this. And then she's like, okay, it works. It works. <laughs> right, with the right learner, with the right learner. So, um, but yeah, you have to keep it. It, it isn't how, we, how kids learn. If yeah. you're just giving them one strip and this is what you're doing, right? Again, I go back to typical language learning. How do we learn language? You just have to be immersed in it. Yes, yes. And how do we learn language? The other, and Elizabeth, do you have any other thoughts on this or questions? No, nope, I'm right on board here as well. I, I'm familiar with the framing your thoughts with my, um, the age population I work with, that's not a program I would be using. However, um, yes, yeah, I run into modeling. I mean, that's my biggest thing is model, 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 model. And so that is still a tricky thing to then for 
parents to understand the potential um, that students will have based on the modeling that you're using with the device. Um, so, yes. Okay. And then that last component here, like, like you kind of referred to, learning language should be fun. It's not drill and kill. And a lot of teachers want to move towards drill and kill. Um, and, yes. But that does not give people the, 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 the motivation to talk. In fact, it gives people a motivation to get out of the situation. If it's drill and kill, people want to get through it as fast as possible and get away from me and get me back immersed in my iPad where I can watch YouTube videos. And then I'll come back and do drill and kill for a while. And then can I, as soon as I can get away from that, I'll go back and I'm not really communicating. But it's, um, I, I, the, the analogy I use here or the story that I use here is you ask any parent of a typically developing kid, you ask them, um, hey, what happened in school today? What did they say? Nothing. Nothing, right? Because, <laughs> because that's, the, that's the truth, right? Like nothing happened that was really out of the ordinary or worth talking about. It was the same old school day. Like yesterday was a school day. And, but, but when do they talk? It's when, oh, Mr. B was walking through and he fell and he scraped his knee and there was blood everywhere. We had to call the nurse or, <laughs> oh my gosh, a bat got loose in the auditorium and it was flying around. These novel, odd, weird things happen, and that's where the language comes out, and they have stories to tell. And so it's our job to design the experiences in a way that it gives them something to talk about, right? Absolutely. Do you have stories like that? Well, will you tell me stories? I'm going to flip over to the other slide. I'm going to stop the share and flip over. Uh, well, I want to share a story with my son just this morning. He, he's um, 14. And he has autism. He's a very bright kid. And he's the kid that says nothing. Or why do we need, even need to talk about it? And he doesn't want me to text him. You know, even, you know, I talk to my daughter through texting because that's what they do. Well, today he texted me, Trump sent us a letter. Right? Like, I'm like, okay. what? And my, my dad, who has uh, passed away at this point, um, received something from the veterans for the um, Vietnam War. And oh, he was just, okay. you know, it was, he was so excited that he had this nice write up and this pins in it. And even though he's passed on, he was still recognized. And so that's exactly it. It was like so novel and so exciting for him. He broke through the nothing and actually texted me real information. <laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm going to flip back over. Oh, do we have some, we have new people too. Okay. Hi. I didn't even see other people came in. Uh, Natalie. Hello, Natalie. Um, okay, so I flipped over to this new slide deck, which you don't have access to, but I can pull some of these slides and throw them in the uh, the other slide deck. Um, because I, I mean, anyway, I can fix that. Uh, but here you asked, Elizabeth asked about sort of the consideration process uh, and the assessment process. Use those terms, the evaluation process. And so um, once upon a time, this is how we did it. Uh, and you'll see it says the old way. The student is having a problem. Vis-a-vis, eh? -vis, they can't uh, communicate. They're having trouble with language, learning language. Uh, an AT person or an AAC specialist or a speech language pathologist is brought in to conduct an assessment or do an evaluation. They generate a report that is generated with recommendations. And then the, this goes to the IEP team that says, hey, Agree or disagree with these recommendations? Let's put something in place. Um, is that generally, I mean, I know that's a very stri stripped down version, but that's generally how it works in your neck of the woods? Uh, yeah, it still does. Still does. Okay. And Elizabeth? Yes, um, for the most part, I would say, but I guess I, I'd like to shift from that model um, based on training and other things to not be, I, I would like to not have to be contracting with outside people as much. Gotcha. Natalie? Yeah, I would say the same thing. Okay, so here's the new, the new hotness. Are you ready? Here's, so when we would do this sort of um, assessment, uh, what we found is that we weren't gathering much new information. In fact, when I say the old way, this is exactly what we did for years and years and years. And I think we helped a lot of kids this way. Don't get me wrong. I don't think that way was, was, was necessarily completely broken. We found that um, when we came to the table with recommendations, we often found that people would fight those recommendations because they had a different perspective. Um, 
they, you know, and I think we find this in IEP meetings now is that a private provider has come up with X. I think it should be lamp words for life. And we might say, no, but we think it should be pro lo quo. And the parents are like, yeah, but have you heard us speak for yourself? And now we've got three different perspectives all wrestling with what it should be and nobody wins, you know. Um, and many times, be by accident, we all come to the table and they just go, look, you're the expert. You said it should be lamp words for life. So just give us lamp words for life and help us implement it. Um, and, and, and it's really probably still mostly the case. It probably does work well in most cases, but still, you said, can we move away from this to a more collaborative model where also you're not relying on some sort of expert? So what we realized is that one of the ways we were deciding what a student should use was um, the set framework, but it was the, uh, when I see, you know, you're familiar with the set framework, we've been working through this now, uh, right? Let me, let me just stop there and make sure. Yes. You're us all talking about the set framework yes uh, working through it in your in your meetings right yes <laughs> thanks mike <laughs> mike's heard of it um so we said we as the as the experts as the person making the recommendation using the set framework but what if we shifted that and put that responsibility on the iep teams uh to the stakeholders and we just facilitated that discussion so that they were thinking about it themselves, right? And so we use the set framework, right? Um, sometimes they even use a little chart like this to help think, th think of their thoughts, put your information in these different, these different you know, sections, if you will. Um, we asked them to think about the set framework as a way to come up with the tools, but also adjust the tasks and the environment. And we apply that to, the, to AAC as well. Um, so here's the newer way. A student's having a problem, again, in language. We come in as the uh, AT people to facilitate the discussion that the IEP team is having. And it doesn't, it doesn't mean that it happens at an IEP meeting. It just ha means that it happens with the IEP team. And then we decide from that what tool we want to try first. Right? Um, so I'm going to give you just a, a little sneak peek here of this. This is sort of what our version of what you guys have been working on. Um, it's, it's us, our resource consideration guide. Uh, we still have a little work to do on it, our own neck of the woods, but the idea is that we'll be at an IEP, um, we'll be with an IEP team, we, which will contain the occupational therapist, the physical therapist, if there is one, you know, the parent, uh, anyone the parent wants to bring, uh, obviously the administrator, a general educator, the case manager, and of course the speech language pathologist. And we'll sit with them and we'll say, okay, what's the student, what's the environment, what's the task, and then what, what tools do we wanna come with specific to communication? This probably looks similar to exactly the things you've been working on and you've been developing. Am I, am I off base there in saying that? No. No. Yes, awesome. that's what we're doing. That's what you're doing, right? Um, Sometimes that'll be enough to get people started, but oftentimes they'll need a little bit more. And so there's another tool, which I think we've provided. Mike, remind me if we have not, but I think we have. It's called the WADI, the Wisconsin Assistive Technology Initiative. I think we have a whole folder in Google Drive with that. Right, Mike? Yes, I think we do. I think you're right. Yeah. Um, and so what we've been working on, you'll see it says work in progress there is that our teams, our, our assistive technology folk, in conjunction with, we have many speech therapists on that who are on our assistive technology team, um, have been working through modifying the Wisconsin Assistive Technology Initiative, the, this specific domain here to communication, to again, have, allow the IEP team to have discussions around all these things. You know, to be thinking about uh, uh, the, the, the seating, the positioning, the access method, the, um, the current language the student has, where we're going with this, so that they are having them, they're thinking of the features that are needed for whatever the, what's going to come last is the tool they want to try. So the first one is just think about the set framework. The second part is to, uh, okay, we need some more help. Not We need more than just a set framework. It's not pointing us to the right tool. Well, okay, let's really dig into features. What does the student need? This checklist, if you will, kind of gives people a, a point, talking points to, to, to work through. Um, and then the 
third part and sort of final part is we do this feature matching uh, where we say, okay, this first column here on this chart where it says needs and considerations, that's where we list out all the features that we sort of picked but that we were working through on this document. Uh, we list those out. All right, it needs to be this certain weight. They need to access it with their eyes. They need to access it with their with direct select. Um, that needs to, uh, the, we want to try and keep the motor plans consistent. Uh, we want to use something that the teachers are already familiar with. Let's put that as a consideration. Uh, if, we if the teachers have to learn something new, that might slow the process down. So let's just throw that in there as a consideration. Um, if, if, uh, if other things are equal, in some cases you have to teach them something new, but if, if everything else comes out in the wash, I, I want that to be a consideration that, that, is, that we're talking about that gets listed over here in this first column. And then we list out the options and then we just see which one works the, you know, hits, gets the most check marks, if you will. Um, sometimes two tools will come out or three tools will all come out in the wash that have the equal amount of check marks. And so we ask ourselves in those, in those cases, which one is least restrictive? You know, wh which do we think of these tools will be least restrictive? Well, geez, you know, um, in our district, most kids have access to lamp words for life. And yeah, this kid could go with lamp. They could go with speak for yourself. It could be either way. But if most kids have lamp words for life, maybe we lean there because that might be least restrictive in our environment, right? We've already got materials made for that. We don't have it for that app. You know, the, those would be parts of the consideration process if everything else was equal. Um, and that would then really brings us to, Elizabeth, you mentioned sort of the, the trialing, if you will. I am not a big fan of the word trial. In fact, I, I mentioned it last night in AT chat, Mike. Um, uh, trialing to me makes it sound like, I don't know, let's try this for a while. Like, like uh, I'll collect data on it. And then I'm going to try trial something else for a number of weeks. And trialing to me is like, it sounds scientific, but it's really hard to be scientific in an environmental setting because in scientific trials, you are trying to control for all the variables except for the variable that you're measuring. So you know that, you know, you try and keep the temperature the same. You try and keep the lighting the same. You try and keep the amounts the same. And in an educational setting, that is extremely hard to do, you know, um, with the, do you pick two weeks? Well, I'm going to try this for two weeks and then I'm going to trial something for uh, the next thing for another two weeks. And I'm going to trial something else for the next two weeks. Uh, well, there's a lot of different variables that affect those trials. I mean, do you mean two weeks, like uh, actually 14 days? Or do you mean like 10 days? What if you had a snow day? Has that ever happened? You know, what, wait, what if the people who are doing the trial get sick? Uh, what if what if it's not having anything to do with the trial, but we haven't done enough implementation uh, training on how to actually implement a communication device that uh, that's why it's failing. And one of the reasons I'm not a big fan of the word trial is especially when it comes to AAC devices is that whole motor planning aspect. Let's say I've decided I'm gonna put, pro and I've seen this happen. I, I get cases like this where people have moved in from out of, out, out, out of our county um, you know, move into our county from someplace else and I read the reports and what they did is they said, okay, we've tried Prolo Quo for two weeks and we taught the kids uh, go and stop. And so they learned the motor plan of where go and stop is for two weeks. They've been practicing go and stop, go and stop. This is where go and stop is. And then because two weeks was up, we took that away and we gave them lamp words for life. It's just as an example, right? And now we taught them go and stop again. And guess what? They did better with Prolo Quo than they did with Lamp Words for Life. It took them longer to learn the Lamp Words for Life. Therefore, we're going to go with Prolo Quo. Well, you changed the motor plan. You, uh, you, affect, you had already set them up for two weeks of instruction and then you moved it where it was. It would be like me moving your tongue around and saying, this is how you say the S sound. And now I'm going to teach you how to say the S sound in a different way. Which, which, which therapy which worked best? Oh, I guess the therapy one worked best because I taught it to you first. You know? So the, I feel like there's a lots of holes that can be poked into the, the concept of trialing. So what I advocate for instead um, is the idea of trying. We use this concept. We use this, we use this rigorous pro process because uh, it took some time to go through the set framework, to go through the, the WADI, uh, our version of the WADI, and then you do this feature matching chart. 
all these people came up with what we think we should try first, just try it. There we've, we've gathered evidence based on what the student's performance is, put it into the IEP as, uh, as, the, as, as what we're going to just do, uh, and then we're going to do it. And, we'll, and because the IEP itself is meant to be a trial, right? Any accommodation at any time, if you feel like it wasn't working, you had data support that you didn't need that accommodation, that you needed a different accommodation, it's meant to be a fluid document that you could pull the team back together and go, yeah, this thing, we got to adjust this thing. Well, let's make an amendment or uh, a revision to this. And so that's what I advocate for. Uh, and that's what we try and do in our neck of the woods is not have a, a trial. We, we sort of ban that word in our neck of the woods. We, we pick something and we go with it. And, and then we, may, we adjust from there. Yeah. Are you in New Hampshire? Do you live in New Hampshire? Me? Yeah. No, I live in Virginia. Okay. So there are different rules here. <laughs> if you want okay. to get it covered by Medicaid. Well, that's, that is, that's national. So um, we, as a school district, are thinking only of how we buy this, the stuff for ourselves. Um, meaning, we're, we're provi if it's underneath the guise of of, um, uh, of IDEA, it's really not meant to be public funds or private. I mean, not, it's not meant to be pri private funds. And so we are thinking how we make the purchases ourselves. Does that make sense? Um, it if does. I'm a we, as a team, we present the options to the the parents because they are part of the team and sometimes they're very adamant that they want to purchase it yes and sometimes you know they're adamant that we will if, it, if it's something that they can't or won't do then we purchase it so and i'm looking at um as you're talking about teams getting together to talk mm -hmm. i think i mean you have vast experience your, your typical team with your typical slp wouldn't even know what's available so they may think they need this, this, and this, but they may never have seen a switch before. Sure. Or that is why, that is why this, so this, this looks like it's a real short document because it says work in progress. It's just meant to be, but this, this whole section of the Wadi is extensive. It's multiple pages of um, right. getting people to understand like, oh yeah, I'm not even thinking that they could be using their eyes or I mean, thinking that the positioning might have an effect, it's meant to get those people at the table who don't know what they don't know, knowing what they should know. <laughs> right. Then, and I think people can identify this. The team still needs to know what's available in technology to support those needs. And that's what I'm talking about. They're not, that's why you can go into school and everybody has touch chat because that's mm -hmm. the one that the SLP knew. Sure. Right. Um, sure. And, and as far as like writing into the IEP, we would never be allowed to write it into the IEP unless we knew it was something that already worked. Really? Yes. And the way, the way, I mean, and I've, everybody that I've seen in New Hampshire doing it, we have a day that they come out with all kinds of equipment and the child gets to use them. The child has a choice of which one they want to choose to, and they always choose the one that we were going to choose. Always. <laughs> right. Because it was the one that they flew on. It's the one that they were comfortable with. It's the one that they produced the most on or was the most visually pleasing to them or whatever. Um, so sure, I couldn't agree day, more. I find the same thing. Yeah, so they get to play with all kinds of things, like different languages. I hate it when they have lamp. <laughs> like, oh man, they really did like lamp. <laughs> Which I don't mind lamp, but teaching in Paris, that's one of those barriers that they really need to learn. If you're not a lamp, if you don't have that semantic based kind of thinking, it's harder for your Paris to, to learn it. Um, yeah, without the right training, you can't just pick up a lamp and know it. Exactly. So that's one of those things. And, uh, and then that's decided. And then we do a 30 day period. And we have mm -hmm. to set two goals. With this device, did they meet those two goals? Like the problem was, is they haven't expanded their vocabulary in the last, uh, last school year. So it could be a goal that we want to see X amount of words expand. Um, or whatever. I have a question. I just, yeah. How are they presented when they're presented with multiple devices? Like how is that presented all at one time and you just see what they gravitate towards? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, exactly. Good question. Uh, generally one thing at a time. And um, it's important to have things that they really love there. Right. And it's sabotage a little bit. It's a little out of reach. It's uh, it's, they can't get the cover open, but it is the thing that they're going to try to get no matter what. Where are you getting the devices from? Uh, we have an AAC person come in with them. Okay. There's, UNH also has like a lending library of some devices too in the area too, but 
Okay. Um, Chris, how long do you try then a device to determine if it works or doesn't work? And then you may kind of go back to the, you know, maybe trying another option. Sure. So, well, that's it's a couple excellent points there. So we try indefinitely, right? And once we've made a selection, our first, and we, if we feel like it's not working, the it is not the tool. In fact, uh, we, very, we, we really strive to not change the tool because chances are the reason it's not working is that's not, that, we, that we somehow botched this whole process and we got the tool wrong. Instead, we haven't provided the instruction in the right way, meaning uh, we need to do more modeling, more descriptive teaching, um, better uh, training of the paraprofessionals. Um, so often, one of the biggest downfalls it, for when you look at a multi-year span is that the teacher has changed, you know, that she's gone on a maternity leave or she quit because autism teachers, you know, have a lifespan of three to five years before they move on to, to, to a different job, you know. Um, so we've, we just, we, we got an autism teacher that is in her third year and we spent an entire year trying to get her trained on how to use an AAC device with implementation and then she left. And so is it the device that failed or is it all the structure around the device that failed? And so we okay. really emphasize that training, um, that job embedded coaching, and try and do that aspect more than the. It's probably the wrong tool because you jump from tool to tool, you're, you'll you'll likely still have the same frustration. A kid will see you will see improvement, no doubt. If I would rip any communication app away from a student that we felt like it wasn't working and gave them another one, yep, they'll see progress because what other choice do they have? <laughs> you know. Um, so and I'll do a little bit better and then I'll plateau again and it will feel like it's not working and then we'll change the tool again and then we'll get see a little bump and then we'll plateau again and we'll just keep going round and round with these different tools. We have to focus on the instruction. Does that, does that help? Yeah. Do you um, work at all with like the grid software or a clicker or anything such as that? So clicker we do. Yes. Uh, grid, you mean grid as the AAC program? Yeah. Yeah, the AAC program. We, we have not really used that program much. It's okay. really the, the big three are the ones we keep talking about is uh, ProLoquo, LampWords for Life, and um, Touchchat are probably the three biggest. Okay. A little bit, you know, Snap, Snap and Read, or Snap and Read, Snap Plus Core First is um, starting to pique uh, some of the speech therapists that I work their interest. But um, what was that sure. called again? Snap plus core first. That is Toby Dynavox's solution. Uh, it's it's to, in my mind it's in some it's some ways equivalent to ProLoquo. I think you find a lot of similar features there. Um, but Cheryl, back to a couple points you made. Right, uh, just I want to reemphasize. You had said you know we find we we find that we often get uh, the the one we thought the kid would go for is the one that the one is the one the kid goes for. And I say that a lot too. Is like. We spent all this time coming up with what we write, right, coming up with what we think the right tool is going to be. How often are we wrong? You know, right. very, very rarely are we wrong if we go through this match, this feature yeah. matching. And we have gone through this process of determining, I mean, before our AAC person comes in with devices, we've gone through this process of what does the child look like? What are their barriers? What are the barriers mm -hmm. in the classroom? What is being used around the school? How many AAC users do you have? Um, so a discussion with the ACC person, it leads to what she's going to bring mm -hmm. based on those discussions. Um, and in the end, though, the, the child got to touch it and try it before sure. they said, let's do it. And I can't recall a time where we changed it afterwards. Now, the ones that I changed in the last couple of years, I think the competency was not assumed mm -hmm. for these kids. So they needed more language desperately. Mm -hmm. It wasn't enough for them. And that's why exactly. Yeah. I had a girl on Go Talk last year. There was zero in it when I got her. She had 36 pages at the end of the year. I mean, this is never yeah. going to support what she needs. She's so frustrated. So yes. she went to Pro Loco. Quo. And then does, yeah. does insurance ever require like information? I know that you don't necessarily like the Chris, the word trial and obviously using multiple to cross compare, but sometimes like and I'm just kind of wrapping my brain around this. Like as an OT, if I'm, if I'm making a recommendation for equipment to be purchased in home, sometimes I have to go through a cross comparison and I have to very clearly are, you know, outline that in a letter of medical necessity and have 
very justifiable information that supports my recommendation that is fairly objective. So I'm just kind of curious, like, have there ever been those insurance stipulations where it comes down to a, a possibility of choices that leads to some of these decisions? Natalie, that, and Cheryl, jump in here, but, but um, Natalie, I think that's exactly where this, I, this notion of trialing three, three things comes from, is that the insurance companies or Medicaid um, requires that you trial three things. And so we have can kind of convinced ourselves that this is the best way to do it is because they've required it. But if you didn't have that constraint, Natalie, it, would that be the best way to determine what a student needs? What if you could go through a process like this um, and this was the justification that you gave to an insurance company, you know, I feel like and, and I'm a little bit, you know, um, uh, like a pirate like this, that uh, I'm really willing to kind of burn the system down and build a better one, you know, uh, than just to embrace the one that we have. Uh, and I understand we have to live in that world, right? So Cheryl, I know you're living in that world where people need to buy their devices and we have to uh, go through that, that uh, those protocols that have been set up by those companies. Um, and by those agencies, but I wonder if there isn't a better way, you know, if we weren't constrained by those. What are your thoughts? I, I completely agree with you, Chris. Like, I, it would be so much easier, and I'm not speaking as much on the device side of things. It would be so much easier to just make a recommendation with the support of reasoning and have it be done. Um, so I very much wish that it could be as simple as that. I just know that sometimes it comes down to, unfortunately, the financial pieces of it. And um, it's, a, it's unfortunate that that's a part of it sometimes. So I, I wish it was more simple. And I like that concept because I do think that it's super confusing from that motor planning piece of switching things over and having to kind of start all over again. Um, just because once you, you know, like you were saying before, you teach one skill and you get them really good at it. And then you switch to trial something else, your data is already going to be skewed because they're just going to need more time to learn something new. Natalie, Cheryl, let me just throw out, Elizabeth, let me throw out one little, uh, a little also gotcha with that whole scenario is at some point you had to decide what you were going to try first, meaning what you were going to trial first. Uh, Cheryl, you guys nailed it down to three things and you had the AAC person bring those three things out or not every, it's not always three things, but sometimes. Yeah, we and always then, have they trial that one day. Gotcha. We have tried three different, five different pieces in that one day. And then they go into trial the one that seems to be the fit for 30 days. I have never had to change it to another device after that. So, yeah, because you get it right the first time. I, I, yes. And the, cause, and the kid had a part of that decision. So there's some ownership in it. And again, yes. I, I work with older kids. So this may not, you know, I, I Somebody who's three is different than somebody who's 10 that you're working with. Sure. Right. So they, they're, I think I can't even speak to that population. I never tried to assess somebody for um, AAC at that age. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so they do the 30 days. And then we understand that if it's a trial device and I have to send it back, we have to really work hard to make sure something else is in place with the same exact language in the same space and time and continuum until their own device arrives. Yeah. So I wonder what would happen if you, I, I see what you're saying. The, the, the piece that I think that stands out to me that what you're saying, Cheryl, is when you've placed them in front of the student, the student actually gets to give some input. You're get, gathering evidence about which one the student seems to like the best. Yes. Right? Yes. And, but the, the variable is someone chose to give them something first. Right? Uh, and that that first novel piece might be uh, I, that's a variable that you you you, can't, you can only give one kid some you can only give something to somebody first once. Do you know what I mean? Yes. At the point we had to make a decision that I'm going to give you lamp first or I'm going to give you proloquo first, even if it's only for these next ten minutes. Someone had to make that decision, and whatever that rationale was, hmm, why do I want to give this kid this first or give that first? That's the rationale we use to say why wouldn't we just give that to them. Can I ask Cheryl a question? Please. Cheryl, do you, um, do you have, out of those three um, maybe that we talked about, LAMP, ProLoquo, and Touch Chat, do you find that you have students that work with all three of those, or you sometimes find that you do gear towards one or a couple of those? They gear towards one. If they're going, if they, it's all about how they, beyond the motor ability and vision ability to access something, 
it's very much about how they think about language. So again, so a kid who really is into the categories of things and the semantic based piece of language is going to love LAMP, right? Mm -hmm. Kids who um, understand the structure of language better, they're going to love touch chat. Mm -hmm. And then in Perlo Quo, there's more thematic boards. So a kid who can't move around a lot, I, tends to go towards that. And so you have students that use all three. Oh, yeah. I mean, no, I mean, you have, I'm sorry, you work with students, a variety of students that then in your school, you have all three different programs that students work with. Uh, I don't have LAMP right now, but I have the okay. other two and I have had I do. It just happens that I don't have one right now. Okay. All right. Just curious. Okay. We, we, I do. Was, yeah. Natalie does. And we primarily use LAMP. About 70% of our kids that have high tech AAC are LAMP words for life. It is so challenging just because you can have in one classroom for my school, you could have kids on every single system and the amount of training that it takes for the adults, you know, the paras or the ed techs that are working with them, whether they rotate or they, they don't, or you're trialing and you're throwing that extra piece in there. It's, it's crazy the amount of time and training it takes for just people to wrap their mind about how those devices are set up and how they're different and how you go from a certain layout to then a bigger layout and how complex it gets um, over time as they get older. And I, I think that one of the biggest limitations to having so many of those systems in place, and again, it's great that there's so much variety, but the amount of training for the adults to be able to carry it over, there's just such limited time for people to grasp and get that extra time to train. And that when you do train, it's just another system you have to start all over again. And that whole concept and that idea that you have to touch it more than them and you have to model, you know, what, even if it's a word, but you're modeling consistently while using it, it's hard to, even for me sometimes to switch between schools and switch between classrooms and get myself reacquainted very quickly with a completely new system or even the layout. Cause I find that with some of them, they'll have, um, slightly different locations and for me I can only imagine for the students but I can just tell you from my experience it is maddening to go within the same program but even just from one layout to a bigger layout how those buttons change and those locations are different when you can't find it it's just so maddening so that's Absolutely. one thing that I, I hate about that so yes. Natalie Cheryl Elizabeth let, we're, we're we've we've gone over time just a little bit Let's continue to have this discussion on Friday. Right. Maybe we can talk about doing another webinar together uh, about the whole coaching and implementation and training piece. Um, something to, to, to Natalie, to, to pique your interest, have, have any of you heard of the specific language system first approach to AAC? No. No. Okay. And I'm sorry, Chris, I'm going to have to bring my son to a sports um, practice, so I'm going to have to step out. But I will see you next Friday then. Okay, yeah, we'll see you Friday. You. Yeah. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, so let's, let's carry on the conversation with that approach. You know, next Friday at some point, we'll, we'll gather together and, and, and chat about it. Or we'll have an entire another webinar or something in the future. Mike, what is that? And sound? what was it called again? What was it called? So, so it's called the specific language system first approach. But if you Googled it, you might have trouble finding it because I kind of made up that name. But it's Can you uh, just like very vaguely go just to explain? Sure. I'll give you a quick, quick flyby. The idea is just what you were saying, Natalie, to solve, sort of solve that problem. What if everybody... Um, uh, once upon a time, you think of AAC as a tier three approach, right? Only individual kids would get uh, everything we talked about today was how to select an individual, uh, the right tool for an individual. Once you've done that for over and over and over and over again, you find that the same tool continues to come out in the wash. And can you make it a tier three, strat uh, sorry, a tier one strategy, meaning something that's available to everybody. So, uh, so imagine an entire school district that was teaching lamp words for life. And if you need a kid with a language difficulty, you just got lamp words for life, uh, which we know does not fit the needs of everybody. It's not a one size fits all, you know, you'll never find a bigger proponent of, of universal design for learning than me, but, but could you find a something that was a one size fits most and from there, you know, uh, we know that not everyone's going to be able to but we're, so we're going to have some prolo quo too. And, then, and we just taught the STEAM vocabulary set. We, we taught where the words are. We yeah. 
Natalie's liking it. She's digging it. I'm loving it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say, Natalie, it comes with because a lot of people do hear, wait a second, are you saying one size fits all? No, I'm not saying that. Yeah, can't we do this individual selection model? Yeah, we can, but. Um, but on a big scale, it's difficult to implement so many systems. Yeah, if you're a teacher and you have this kid, you sit at your kid piece at the table and kid number one has touch chat and kid number two has prolo quo and kid number three has lamp words for life. How as a teacher are you supposed to model and know where all the words are and all these different languages, you know? Very I cool. Of, I think a lot of these kids have pairs. Um, certainly they have subs some days. I think <clears throat> it's more of our frustration and I know, because I'll go to one kid who's on 42 touch chat and another's on 60 and then I go to Pro Loco. Um, and then this young lady I just trialed on a 13 inch for her vision. So that moved things around. Um, and I'm like, okay, which, which one is this and where does it go? Right. And I just laugh with the kid that you know this better than me and certainly the parents know it better than me and I expect them to. So I think our frustration is not always their frustration. Yeah. And, and I'm in a regular school and I had seven AAC devices last year which is very in order. It was a lot of work. So yeah. I did have a lot. Um, and the paras became proficient in the ones that they were using. Yeah. Um, and, and more so than we do. And I, I expect that to happen. Cool. All right, let's carry on this conversation next week on Friday when uh, we get to see each other and uh, we'll take it from there. Mike, does this sound like a plan? That sounds like an awesome plan. That This was a lot of fun and it's an area that I'm not very uh, well versed in. So I enjoyed the conversation and listening. So I appreciate uh, the ability to lurk behind the scenes. So thank you guys. It was a great conversation. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this thank was you, great. Mike. Yes, Thanks for making thank it happen. Thank you, ladies and Chris. And I'll see you guys all on Friday. All okay. right, sounds Actually, good. Actually, I'll see you Monday. Oh yeah, you'll see me Monday and I'll talk to you in 10 minutes when we get on another call. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye, Cheryl. Bye, Natalie. Thanks for being here. Bye. Thank Bye, you everybody. so much. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.